Morning, Bridge Church. How we doing? Uh, it's good to see. I missed you last week. Hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving. Uh, like us, it's just a very gluttonous time. Let's just be honest. I ate way too much. We had some great friends from back east who were joining us, and since then, I have aged another year. My birthday was this past Wednesday. Hey, look at that! And so uh, I, I feel no different. I, I feel no different. So you know, everybody asks, like, "Hey, do you feel different now?" No. Do you? And I didn't even know what year I had turned. Like, my, it took my children to tell me, I thought I turned 47 this year. They're like, no, Dad, you're 46. And I was like, yes, I got a year back. <laughs> I didn't do anything, and I got an entire year back. And so for those of you joining us on Bridge Church Live, I'm glad that you are with us as well. Hey, if you've got a Bible, go ahead and join me in the Old Testament book of Exodus. We're going to be in chapter 13 today. But I'm going to pray first for one thing. So, as many of you know, Pastor Nick was up here and he did a killer job last week, right? He did an amazing job. And tomorrow he has a pretty significant surgery coming up. Uh, tomorrow morning he's up at Stanford and he's got open heart surgery. And so we as a church, here's one of the greatest things that we get to do for each other is, is pray for each other because church isn't just the building. Church is a family, correct? Yes. We are. And when a family member is facing something pretty significant, family wants to rally around them. So we can't all be there for him. Uh, the hospital room's not big enough for that. But you know what we can do? We can join together in prayer, right? And so that's what we're going to do right now. And so here is what I'm asking you to do as I pray for us, is just join in agreement. As, as you're sitting there, like if you want to verbally go amen, like amen means like let it be, like so be it, like I agree with that. And so if you want to get verbal, if you've got some Pentecostal roots, get there, go for it. If, 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 if you're more of like a, a Presbyterian ilk in your background, you can say it silently. Guess what? God hears it either way. And so join with me as we pray on behalf of Pastor Nick and his surgeon, Dr. Wu, and all those that are entrusted to his health and his upcoming surgery tomorrow morning. All right? So, Lord, we do come before you, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who knit us together and knows us and knows Nick, and we pray right now, Lord, for an incredible procedure tomorrow morning that you would guide the hands of Dr. Wu and the rest of the doctors and the nurses and the administration committed into Nick's care because you're the one who gave them their mind. You're the one who gave them their gifts and talents, and you're the one who orchestrates and moves to complete your good and your perfect and pleasing will. We ask that there would be zero complications. We ask that everything that needs to be done would be done with exact precision. Lord, I pray also that through Nick and Laura's life, that the doctors would see not just a patient, but a follower of Jesus in the way in which they engage them and respond with them. And Lord, we also ask not only for zero complications, but for a quick and speedy recovery. Lord, in advance, we thank you for the ways in which you care for and love and will guide your servants as they care for Nick and his family. And it's in Jesus' name, and everyone said? Amen. Amen. That's awesome. I look forward. I'll keep you guys updated uh, about what's going on, but uh, if you've got more questions about that, well, then we'll be telling you about it. So hopefully you have found your way over to the book of Exodus. We're continuing on in a series about breaking free of captivity. Yeah, man, we can all relate to that, right? Breaking free of the things that, that hold us back into the freedom that Christ has for us, because it was for freedom, it says, the Bible tells us, that Christ has set us free. Man, like we, we, all, we all want freedom, right? Let's be honest. We all want to live in freedom. We all have things in our lives that are holding us 
back. They might be temporary, they might be systemic, but whatever they are, these are things that in Christ, he can break us free from that. Man, I feel like that could be the message in itself today, and we could pray and be liberated in Jesus' name and all go home, but we have got some ground to cover in Exodus chapter 13. So here we are. Last week, we had gotten to the plagues, 430 years of slavery to the Egyptians, and it's time to go. Finally, God has punctuated his power in front of the Egyptians, and it is time for them to leave the land of their captivity. They've had an oral tradition that's been talking about a day and a place in which they're going to go, and finally they have seen the outstretched mighty hand of provision of God leading them, demonstrating not only his power against those who oppress Israel, but also his protection for them, and the day of liberation is upon them. And the thing that punctuates their day of liberation is one of the greatest, if not the greatest of annual feast for Israel, and that is the Passover, the remembrance of the death of the firstborn for Egypt, but God's salvation and saving and care and protection for Israel. Just a reminder here in chapter 13, verse 3, it says, then Moses said to the people, remember this day. When you came out of Egypt, out of the place of slavery, for the Lord brought you out of here by the strength of his hand. The Lord did it. Don't start thinking at some point when you leave this place that you somehow did this yourself. Remember, it is God who liberates and for them to celebrate that. And there is something for us to learn and to remember that in any breakthrough or any bondage-breaking moment of our lives, we are to look back and what? Celebrate God's provision, amen? We're to celebrate the way in which he worked and orchestrated in our lives that, that we would experience freedom. And in this transition from the moment of their captivity to the place of their freedom, there are some significant lessons. There's two in particular that we're going to look at this morning as they relate to our lives, moving beyond captivity into the freedom that Jesus would have for us. And so I know we already prayed for Pastor Nick, but we're going to pray about And within this text and for our head and our heart this morning, because we believe that we are congregationally as a people of God meeting and being formed by the Spirit of God, correct? And that we're not just collecting information, but we're pleading with God for personal life transformation, that we leave this place different than the way in which we came in. So on that note, let me pray. Lord, we do ask that you you would do a work in us. Don't just fill our heads with information, but mold and make and transform our hearts for transformation. And we think differently, that we act differently because of your promises and your word to us. And it is in Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. So, chapter 13, now move your attention to verses 17 and 18. This is where we're going to be camping here for a little while this morning. It says, When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them along the road to the land of the Philistines even though it was nearby. This is kind of interesting, right? Don't go this way, even though it's nearby. For God said the people will change their minds and return to Egypt if they face war. So he led the people around toward the Red Sea along the road of the wilderness, and the Israelites left the land of Egypt in battle formation. I am, to my own self-admission, directionally challenged, okay? I think one of the greatest developments in the 21st century has been Google Maps. I literally don't go anywhere, even though I now live in a city that's a grid. I mean, north, north, south, east, west, I get it. I still, I'm an efficiency junkie. Like, I don't want to get lost, and if I get lost, and I get frustrated, and so anywhere I go, for the longest time, like, I'll go from my house to the church, and I'm like, which is the fastest way? And depending on the day, it'll change the direction. However, if you use Google Maps, there's been a time when you've been driving something, and all of a sudden, Google informs you, thank you very much, Google, whoever that sweet lady's voice is, and she's like, you know, there is a detour ahead of you. We're rerouting you, so recalculating. 
And all of a sudden I realize that it's, it's taking me away from the path that I would like to go, but getting me to my destination in a faster way. But what if Google didn't tell you why it was redirecting you? What if all of a sudden you're driving and it's telling you directions and it says redirecting you too? You'd go, well, well, why are you taking me a different way than where I want to go? Is not the way that was set the fastest and best way to go? But at least Google tells us. But what if it didn't? Would we trust it? I'll tell you no. I wouldn't. I'd be frustrated with it. Because I think many times, and we, most of us think most of the time, we know what's best and the best path and route for us to go, right? Well, in this passage, we've got to ask ourselves, why does God direct us in some of the ways he takes us? Why does he lead us in some of the ways in which we go? And the fact of the matter is, we see where we want to go. God knows where we need to go. We can only see what's ahead of us and Let's just be honest, what we want and what we think is best. We know where we want to go. But God, because he is outside of space and time, knowing us and his good and perfect plan for us, he knows where we need to go. And and as we look at this passage, the first point that we need to understand is this. The fastest way isn't always the right way. I hate that line. Honestly, there are points that you got to understand that any good preacher has got to first preach the message to themselves before they can dispense it to others. And this point challenges me because you know what? I don't like it. I don't like that the fastest way isn't always the best way because we're efficiency junkies, aren't we? We like our fast food. We like to be able to download our movies. We don't even download movies anymore. We like stream them. We don't even have to leave our homes to go see a new release anymore. Praise Jesus. <laughs> I like my conversations quick. I like my meetings quick. Everybody here at the church knows that if a meeting with me exceeds 45 minutes, I start to wander. I'm like, y'all want to hang out or something? That's great. But 45, like, like, let's get to it. Let's talk about it. Most of us are efficiency junkies. We like it fast. Do we like a slow car or a fast car? And everybody said? Yeah. You like a fast car. You don't want a slow car. We like things that are quick. And many times we've been taught that the quickest distance between two areas is a straight line. And anything that detracts from that is called a detour. And I have yet to meet the person who, when they are driving somewhere and sees a detour, is like, yes. (laughs) We don't get it. Like, we don't like it. And I'll tell you what, ever since I've moved to the West Coast, Caltrans, especially here in Fresno County, I don't get it. This is nothing on you, but I would like to be informed when you decide to shut down streets for an undisclosed amount of time. You have no forewarning, and you have no idea how long it's going to be there. And they decide that they want to work on these things at like the worst times during traffic. And so right outside my neighborhood, uh, I remember I had to go down to Ashland, and and between, oh, I don't forget, see, look, I don't even know the streets. I was like, there's a street, and there's like another street. (laughs) And I knew exactly where I needed to go, and I knew exactly how long it was going to take me to get there, only for me to turn down the street, and it just said closed. And I'm like, but this is the quickest way. What I didn't realize is that the road was gone. Like, the road was gone. If I would have driven down the road, there was about a 15-foot ditch in the middle of the road. And the detour wasn't a distraction. The detour was actually something for my benefit. It was something for my protection. But what if we started looking at detours in our life a little bit different? Huh? Like about this wilderness excursion that God took Israel through. Because as we look back at the text, even though they knew where they wanted to go, God took them a different direction and the detour could have been seen as a frustration, but the detour was actually protection. 
I want us to hear this and, and really land on this for a little while. Here we go. We think that if we're not getting what we want, God's keeping something from us. But the truth could be that he's keeping us from something. Did you hear that? When it's not going according to plan and schedule like we think or we want, we believe that God's withholding something from us. Just give me that relationship. Just give me that promotion. Just give me that new job. Just give, just give me the thing that I want in the speed and time in which I want it. And then all of a sudden we hit a detour and we think God's keeping something from us. But what if we reframe that? And we trusted his leading. And we've done everything that we can and everything that we're supposed to do. And what if there's a grace disguise there and what he's actually doing is he's kept something from us. He's kept us from experiencing a heartache. He's kept us from experiencing a difficulty. He's kept us from experiencing something that we would not be prepared for. Listen to what it says in verse 17. God did not lead them along the road to the land of the Philistines, even though it was nearby. For God said the people will change their minds and return to Egypt if they face war. The quickest way where they needed to go was going to go through opposition that they weren't ready to face. 400 years after this, they still weren't ready to face the Philistines under King David. He was still a boy at that point. He knew in the middle of their freedom as they left the land that they would engage a degree of resistance and not only what would that resistance do to frustrate them, it would what? Send them back. They would go back to a place of captivity. They would go back to a place they had just been liberated from. They would go back to the starting point. God doesn't want that for our lives. And many times he'll redirect the ways in which we end up going and us not realizing that he's not keeping something from us. He's keeping us from something. He's protecting us. He's loving us. Either God is loving or he's not. Which is it? I'm going to lean on what the Bible says and it says that he is. And it says that he's good. And he says he knows what he's doing. The question we have to ask ourselves is, do we trust it? Do we trust that we might be experiencing a grace in disguise? And so here's the question that I want you to write down. It's going to be on the screen, but this is what I want you to write down. All of us to be asking ourselves when it comes to feeling as though we're not getting exactly where we want to go in the time that we want to get there. So here it is. Have you ever thought that he may be taking longer because God is protecting you from something? Have you ever thought that? Now, I don't mean that you just pray and you just fold your hands and, and you sit there and go like, well, nothing's happening. Well, you haven't moved, okay? Like God gave you hands and feet. He said, like, go. But when you've done everything that you can do, you've been responsible, you've been a good steward, you've, you've done everything that you're capable of doing, and it's still not happening, Man, you have peacocked around that girl and she is just not paying attention to you. Like you have just, man, you've asked her out half a dozen times. You're like, this is how much I make and this is what I can do and I love Jesus and you love Jesus too. And she's like, she's just not, she's just not that into you, dude. Maybe God's keeping you from just a horrible relationship. But this is what I want. God's like, this isn't what you need. Man, you've got the best looking resume. You've polished it up. You got that, I mean, you got like the old school 1990s glamour shot. Like, mm. <laughs> they open up your resume and there's just like, mm. You're just like, you got like the gleam off your teeth going and everything. And you're like, I'm qualified. This is where I'm supposed to go because life is always supposed to look like this, right? Wrong. Who, who always says that we're taking one more rung at a time as opposed to like life is like this and, and then it's here. Believe it or not, even as a pastor, you're like, yeah, but don't you have it all together all the time and it isn't always easy? Uh, no. There are seasons where I'm like, God, what are you doing? And why are you doing it like this? He goes, have you ever thought that maybe I'm protecting you from something? Do everything that you can do. But are you asking yourself and do you believe that he's taking you and that you're trusting him to do what's best 
for you. Do you believe that? Do you believe that as you trust him and as you follow him and you do everything that you're capable of doing, that he is doing what's best for you? Because I'm here to tell you he is. He's doing what's best for you, even if it doesn't feel like what you want the way that you want it. So Israel's been slaves for 400 years and it's time to get to the promised land. We're moving on into our second point. But even though they were free... They weren't really ready. Even though they were free, they they weren't really ready. In their wandering, God was preparing. We're going to get to that in just a minute too. Because in our wandering, many times God is doing his greatest preparing for us. J.R. Tolkien wrote Lord of the Rings. If you like to watch these like editor's uncut version, like 16 hours, good for you. Uh, But he's a genius in a lot of the things that he wrote. And in the middle of one of the books, he wrote a poem, a poem entitled, All That Is Gold Does Not Glitter. And there's this line that maybe many of you have heard, and if not, you'll hear it today in regard to wandering. He says, all that is gold does not glitter, Not all those who wander are lost. Did you hear that? Because many times if somebody asks you, like, what are you doing right now? You're like, "Ah, I don't know. Like, that doesn't feel like a very substantive answer, does it? Because we're always supposed to have all the answers to everything all the time, correct? You know what I'm talking about. You feel anxious when you're sitting around and there's like half a dozen people and everybody seems to have it all together, all their ducks in a row, and they get around to you and they're like, how's it going for you right now? You're like, you know, I'm here. I'm, I'm here. I'm going to go get some bean dip, you know, and you just, you walk away because you don't have, because honestly, in that moment, in that season, you're wandering. But you know what? Here's something. If we've done all that we can do and we're following Jesus, yet we don't know necessarily what's next, God has used the wilderness and wilderness wandering all throughout Scripture for a time of preparedness. You might not feel like God's doing something, but he always is. You realize that? You might feel that you're in neutral, but he's still moving you in the right direction. You just might not feel like you're accomplishing something, but he's accomplishing something in you. I'll tell you the most profound seasons of personal growth in my life have been when I just don't know what's next. I don't know how to organize it. Good grief. I'll tell you one of the greatest lessons was 2020. As a leader who's strategic, who thinks, who knows what's next, and all of a sudden you're trying to figure out what's happening from week to week, we easily understood in that moment how much not in control we are. Amen? I don't know about you. I was turning out, you, you, you go back, I was turning out videos like every other week, like, hey, church, it's good here. We don't know what's going to happen, but we love you. And it's in those moments of wandering, we realize that God is refining. In our wandering, he is refining. Because here's the thing we got to understand. Maturity takes time. So what if you're in a place you don't know what to do right now? And you're rattling the gates of heaven, asking God, just tell me what's next, what's next. Maybe we change the tune of the prayer and ask, what are you doing in me? What do you want to show me? What are you refining in me? What needs to mature and develop in me? Because God wastes no time. And if we've done what we're to do and we're trusting him and his leading, we change our story and ask God, what are you doing in me? Because even if you feel like you're in a season of wandering, doesn't mean you're lost. Amen. It still means he's leading and it definitely still means he's working. And what he's done in the past, he will continue to do in the future because he does not change. Amen? Amen. Secondarily in this What God has done for us later 
he's going to do through us. You're like, okay, unpack that. Great, I'm glad you asked. Here we go. There's something about this passage coming up, especially in verse 18, that is very insightful. It's subtle, but the significance of it is very impactful for us. It says, God did not lead them along the road to the land of the Philistines because they said, hey, if they go that way, they're going to face war. They're not ready for war. Then they're going to go back. But here we go. Verse 18, it goes on to say this. So he led the people around toward the Red Sea along the road of the wilderness, and the Israelites left the land of Egypt. Here we go. In what? Battle formation. Isn't that interesting? Leave the land, but get ready to fight. But I'm not going to take you to a place to fight because you're not ready for it. But I need you to act as though and be prepared for the battles that are going to be in front of you because they are. Just because you are free doesn't mean the fight is over. Amen? Oh, somebody needs to hear that just a little bit more because many times, here it is, we're like, I follow Jesus. Isn't it all going to be easy right now? Oh, yeah. And that is where we are set up for a knockdown. It's like the prize fight and some cocky person putting their chin out there and then they wonder why they woke up five minutes later. You're like, well, because you put your face out there thinking you already run and then you got knocked out and you came to seeing that they're raising the belt that you used to have. Like you can't, you can't do that. That even though Jesus frees us, there's still a fight ahead of us. I, I, I love Richard Friedman. He's a professor of Hebrew and comparative literature at UC San Diego. All of you go, mm, good, I've read so much of his stuff. We haven't. But he has this in regard to freedom and our preparedness to fight. He says this, one does not acquire responsibility instantly when one becomes free. Did you hear that? I'll say it again. One does not acquire responsibility instantly when one becomes free. Free. See, they had been slaves for 400 years. That battle readiness, battle preparedness, knowing how to fight collectively as a unified whole, they had no idea how to do this. They had no experience. They had no time under their belt doing that. Nonetheless, God told them as they're about to go, they need to be ready to fight. But in preparation to fight, God did the fighting for them to begin with, right? Did they free themselves? No. Moses told him, remember, back in chapter 13, verse 3, I did this. Moses tells him, remember, God's the one who freed you. So there's a time in our lives, and our walk with Jesus, that we move from the time in which God fought for us to the point in which he's going to fight through us. Listen to this. When did God fight for us and we couldn't do it ourselves? Romans 5.8. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. We were lost in our sins, separated from God, unable to be perfect enough and do what was needed in order for us to have a reconciled relationship with a perfect God. We simply couldn't do it. The battle was not ours to be won. But while we were yet sinners, I mean, I... I hope we go back to this. Remember, when we were despicable, when we were disgusting, when we were separated from God, God in Christ Jesus came into the world to do for us what we couldn't do ourselves. He's like, you're already defeated before you begin, but I will come and I will be your victor for you. I'll fight. I'll cross the finish line and hand the medal to you if you will place your trust in me. I will give you my victory for you. But then many times we stop there and we're like, I won, I won in Jesus, but it doesn't end there. See, listen to this. As Jesus freed us from the power of sin, the Holy Spirit empowers us to fight sin. Did you know that? Holy Spirit in you. Jesus goes, it's better for me to go. The Holy Spirit, the counselor and the comforter is going to come. Counselors. Counselors tell you the things that you need to know in order to hear what you need to do. Did you catch that? You go to a counselor, you need to listen because the counselor is going to be able to see you in a way that you can't see yourself. The third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, is in you as a counselor to help us fight our continued battle with sin. That we were freed in Christ. And now he leads us out in battle formation filled with the 
power of the Holy Spirit. You know that he's placed in you everything that you need for anything you'll face. You know that? Is that comforting? That he's placed in you everything you'll need for anything you'll face. But Lord, I don't know what to do. I've got a teenager who's just not listening, who's just not responding, who's like, doesn't just, they just want to jettison the faith. They, they don't even see me anymore. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Spirit will do things in you as we rely on him. Lord, my marriage is just kind of like put together with Elmer's glue right now. He's put everything in you that you need for what you're going to face. Maybe it's ongoing patience with a spouse that needs to see God working in you. Maybe it's patience he's developing in you towards them. Lord, I'm stuck in this job. I really believe you've got something better for me. He's like, trust me. Trust the way that I'm leading you. Trust what I provided in you. This morning as we take communion together, we're reminded of the God that we can trust, right? Why? Because of the sacrifice that he made for us. If you haven't gotten a communion cup, I'd go ahead and encourage you. We've got tables up front and we've got a couple in the back. For those of you in the balcony, we've got them back there too. It's a time of remembrance. That's what communion is. And I would hope for us today, it's a time of remembrance that God's leading is good, amen? Yeah? The Bible tells us there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end leads to death. But God, you need to take me this way, you need to do it this way. And he's like, but maybe I'm, I'm protecting you from something. Trust me. Trust me. says on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus, Jesus reframed the Passover for his disciples. He was like, you know, our forefathers used to do this in remembrance of their liberation from Egypt towards the promised land. And he goes, now you need to understand this is your liberation from sin into eternal redemption and relationship with the Father, amen? amen? It's beautiful what Jesus did. He goes, man, you saw it one way and, and, and I'm gonna reframe it for you because I can do that. And as Israel walked out of Egypt by the mighty hand of God, by the mighty hand and finished work of Jesus, by his body, take that piece of bread. And he's like, the demonstration of what I'm gonna do, yeah, there were some plagues, but but I'm about to make a sacrifice that my body would be broken so that your life, your soul will be liberated. Take and eat. And those disciples would have picked up a cup thinking that they're about to remember blood that was over the doorpost of their ancestors' homes in Egypt when they were slaves. And the angel of death would pass over and Jesus goes, my blood is also that the angel of death would depart from you. That there would be no separation between you and the Father. That there would be reconciliation and restoration. And the proof of that is going to be coming in the spilling of my own blood on your behalf. Take and drink. Lord, thank you that you liberate us. 
allow us in this season, many of us are thinking and reflecting back on a year, some of things we're really excited about, some things that may feel bewildering, but allow us to trust you as we follow you. We might not necessarily understand the directions that you're taking. You're not telling us as you're recalculating, you're just saying, trust me, trust me. And Lord, as you lead us into life, let us also know that you have equipped us to be battle ready. You've put your spirit in us and there's nothing that we will face that you have not equipped us with by the power of your Holy Spirit. So Lord, thank you for liberating us. In Jesus' name, amen.